if you don't understand how your customers make money and how your customer service their customers, you're going to be at a serious deficiency because you're going to think you're solving for X when what you need to solve for is Y and Z, mm -hmm. right? It's not, yeah, yeah. Business acumen is such a huge part of working together, right? Conversations are at the heart of everything we do. But how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of B2B EQ. Today's guest not only has a wealth of knowledge and someone I'm excited to have on the show, he's active in Pavilion, a number of those communities. So not only have I learned from him in the past for free, but I can't wait to have him on and ask a bunch of questions today. He's a RevOps expert who moves the industry forward and he is bringing his skills to both Fortune 100 companies and high growth startups. CRO of the Carabiner Group, Cliff Simon. Cliff, great to have you. Thanks for having me, Tim. You are too kind. Hey, it's been fun to follow your journey. And, and we start off right before this, we were talking about the power of community and some of the changes in sales. And, and community revolves around trust. So take us back. You started Carabiner Group. I've seen absolutely exponential growth over the last few years. How did it all start? How did you get your foot into this space? B2B is competitive. Where do we go from there? Yeah, uh, I mean, the the genesis of Carabiner is really interesting, right? Um, I know there's a bunch of podcasts and things out there where Seamus tells his story about how he started doing Salesforce consulting when he was in high school, how he spoke at Dreamforce when he was like 17 years old, right? That whole piece of it. Um, and he had started the company about three, four months before I joined. Mm -hmm. um, and we met on a Slack channel on a community of all places. Uh, we met on wow. RevGenius. Uh, the first day I had signed up for that community, uh, posted that I was looking for something new. We connected within two weeks. I had signed an offer letter um, to join this fledgling company um, mm -hmm. that was doing Salesforce consulting. And um, two weeks before that had happened, I had just joined Pavilion uh, because I was interviewing for head of and VP of sales roles at Seed and Series A companies. And I didn't have access to any of my playbooks anymore. So I was like, oh, all the templates available on Guru worth the weight of admission, right? Because yep. it's going to save me so much time and then end up diving into the community really deeply uh, and sort of that that genesis of Carabiner and um, me taking revenue growth architecture is what really pushed my entire mindset around, oh, we can't just do Salesforce. We have to look at everything end to end. Mm -hmm. And that was born out of early frustrations too. I think my, the first or second client I ever brought on for the company uh, we had signed on to do a bunch of Salesforce work, but all the problems lived in HubSpot. So we made no money on that client at all for the first <laughs> six months that they were with us because all we did was pay a HubSpot consultancy to do the HubSpot work. Oh, geez. <laughs> so um, that lined up pretty well with this uh, revenue growth architecture course that Winning by Design did, right? I sat in that first one um, that Jocko taught. And after the first mm -hmm. course, or rather the first class of the course, we went out and I changed all of our positioning, all of our messaging to RevOps as a service. We went out and grabbed the trademark on RevOps as a service and we make RevOps easy. And it catapulted us forward really quickly. Uh, we went from doing what was like five clients a quarter to five clients a month. Wow. Right. And you know, our ECVs weren't small, right? They're, you know, on the low six figure side. Um, but it was amazing to see just how quickly that change in positioning and messaging and um, tying that to the existing ethos of Carabiner, which was people pay way too much money for consulting. Consultants take your money, run away, and they're not incentivized to help you with long-term growth. Uh, we married all those things together is like the perfect mixture. Right? It was right before everybody started doing RevOps um, mm -hmm. and it really blew up. So we, we caught the crest of the wave, um, which is really cool. And, and timing's a big piece of that, but I go back to the consulting side because a lot of people do get that. You know, you come in, you're a consultant, eh, give me a big business strategy, drop something on my plate, and then you leave. 
being a part of community and being community led growth and in terms of what you were talking about with your growth story, you can't do that. You have to be, I mean, when you're in the community, like your reputation, the trust, all those factors play into your growth tremendously. And you were saying, saying we've seen, you know, was a four X or four and a half X growth over the last few years in terms of yeah, so led break that down. Yeah. So that first year, um, we, we had started that community bit and, um, we were doing it in a handful of communities where we knew rev op rev ops operators played as well mm -hmm. as the people that were making decisions around that. But also like I was getting deeply involved in the community because I was hungry to learn and yeah. continue my, my personal growth journey. Right. I had never been a VP of sales prior to this. So it took rising execs and, uh, end up taking CRO school revenue growth architecture and a handful of other things. Uh, I don't know, I, I've probably taken half the pavilion catalog at this point. Um, nice. But between that and networking and learning from folks in places like WizOps, RevOps, Co-op, Sales Hacker, um, all of those things have sort of culminated because, you know, same people come to and play in different areas, right? But to your point, like, your name is your name, right? Yeah. You only get one chance to build a reputation. And we've all seen it play out over the last two and a half, three years where personal brands have an amazing ability to drive a corporate brand even further, right? It's a lot easier to drive um, in a mystique or um, an aura, right? Mm -hmm. Around an individual than it is a company. And then if you can get a couple of those people together from a company, you can then create that, right? You get that Jobsy in effect around Apple. Yeah, um, You get that Bill Gates effect with Microsoft. And um, not to say that we're at that level by any means, but Seamus carries a bit of that. And then uh -huh. I do too. And then you put those things together and it's really helped elevate the brand um, because we've had the opportunity to have a lot of really good conversations with people, whether that was on calls like this where we're meeting each other you know, halfway across the country over Zoom or mm -hmm. we're doing it over dinner or conferences or whatever else it might be. So mm -hmm. just consistently getting face to face with people, having conversations and not necessarily not necessarily saying this is how you do your job but mm -hmm. this is how i've dealt with a problem similar to that in the past take it or leave it but this might be useful and if it is fantastic I i'm happy to have helped and then the end of the conversation ends up being well what do you actually do well we do revops consulting and not trying to sell you anything if it's helped you great yeah. if there's an opportunity in the future awesome if not no problem and if you know somebody that you know because friends ask friends who they trust yeah. about how they can solve their problems if someone asks you and about revops help could you mention us like, would you think of us would, mm -hmm. we, would we be top of mind and that drove so much of it um and it's amazing just like from a, a meetings booked perspective like the standard kpis that people care about uh, we tracked it for six months at the second half of 21 mm -hmm. um using a community-led motion i was able to book about 83 meetings a month for wow. six months and then I stopped tracking it because it was just too onerous. Um, <laughs> but that's amazing. I mean, I'm thinking of sales organizations right now that have every tool under the sun, every spam can, and you name it. Oh, we have none of that, man. None <laughs> of that. And SDRs are having a hell of a time booking meetings, right? They don't have anywhere near 83. So you got to demystify this a little bit for me because I think in your space and people say, oh, well, it's consultant. He, he's a subject matter expert. It's different than scaling out a bigger B2B sales org. But I disagree with that. I, I Yeah, I disagree wholeheartedly with that as well. Like when I was in AE, I became a subject matter expert, both at the macro and micro levels about the industries in which I was selling to. Mm -hmm. Right. If you're working I, like I did, I used to work in consumer finance compliance. You fit, you go and find out and learn as much as you can about all the regulations, who are the regular regulators, who they're answering to, um, where do they go to learn, right? You, you pick up all of those pieces. And before COVID, you would go to the conference. And yeah. if your company wouldn't pay for you to go to the conference, you found a really, really cheap hotel room and you hung out at the bar and you hung out at the restaurant that the conference was yep. being held at. And you picked people up and then had conversations, right? And then yeah. over time, they would consistently see you and now you would build a relationship and you'd be able to either work with them or get an intro into people that they knew, right? It's much of the same. But now that we live in this digital world where I can meet with people in Australia and London and in San Francisco, but at the drop of a hat, like it's, 
it's pretty darn cool how far you can reach. And we've got these communities where people are always looking for help and for answers. And there's this whole psychological thing in the Western world, at least, of instant gratification. Right. Yeah. So if someone asks a question and I can answer quickly and lead with giving, right? If I can uh -huh. lead with kindness and not expect anything in return, th that adds up, right? We, we didn't have any marketing dollars to spend that first year. I think we spent mm -hmm. $1,200 in marketing total. Um, like maybe four grand if you count like a couple conferences that we went to, right? Uh -huh. um, so there's no marketing spend, but a ton of guerrilla marketing. You know, you're talking 40 to 60 Zoom calls a week. Yeah. where someone else is hearing the name and hearing the name and hearing the name. And then it starts, people start talking about it. We start getting people coming inbound to our website. They had no idea how they found out about us. But when we dig in, it's like, oh, well, someone from our board heard about you from one of their friends on another board where you helped X company, right? Um, and we started seeing a lot more of that, right? And it's not just about, oh, I'm having a conversation with you. And if you don't buy from me, you stuck. No, mm -hmm. like there's a long game, right? There is. And there's a network effect that ripples out consistently. I mean, it's hard to know how that's always going to come back, but it does. And sometimes it comes back five months later. Sometimes it comes back a year later. Sometimes it happens right away. And you have to be ready for all of those things. And you have to be thinking about that long-term effect. It, it it's something that most revenue teams, I think, they get so short sighted. They live quarter by quarter, and they don't realize that that snowball has to has to build. And you know, just thinking, we did a report over six hundred B two B buyers and sellers, and we just got to survey them. And and the one gap that they all talked to is all of the people that were approaching them to sell them stuff knew their product, right? Like, hey, I know what I sell. Mm -hmm. But very few of them, I think it was 80% were proficient in knowing the product, which I'm still worried about that 20%, but that's okay. And then it was like only 20% were actually proficient about talking to them about their business challenges and what is actually going on in their business, their industry. Which, which is incredible, right? Yeah. Like how, what, a, what a massive gap. <laughs> if you don't understand how your customers make money, and how your customers service their customers, you're going to be at a serious deficiency because you're going to think you're solving for X when what you need to solve for is Y and Z, mm -hmm. right? It's not, yeah, yeah. Business acumen is such a huge part of working together, right? I think it's why we've done so well. Mm -hmm. uh, Seamus and I both come from backgrounds and a lot of folks at the company too are like worth thinking about their business actively. Right. It's even when we're going through discovery, like, this isn't going to be right for you or we're not going to be right for you because that's, you're not in the right stage to work with a company like us. Or these are these other things you need to get figured out first. Yeah. I, I, I'd love to take your money. Sure. But it's not going to do you any <laughs> good. So why don't you go spend it on something that will or Amazing. take a look at some processes internally first and figure that out? Because if you don't, don't even have that mapped out yet. Like tech, the technology piece isn't going to do you any good. So. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of emotional intelligence and kind of like again playing that long long game and really sitting there and saying let me learn let me see where I fit in best and just choosing those and I think sometimes we we get short sighted of I just need to book that money for the next quarter especially yeah. in the VC startup world rather than really looking at it and then it causes all those challenges long term because the the companies that are like in the cloud 100 that just came out on Forbes. All of them, to me, they went on brand more than anything else. They're just, they're brands that you know or that you would trust. Mm. And, and trust. so- I love that word. <laughs> yeah, there's something there. Like, it was what brought me to Caribbean or group to have you come on. RevOps is an interesting topic. I want to get into RevOps as a service and, and learn a little bit more about that for our listeners. But there's there's something about how you've you've worked in communities. And if you can share any of those secrets, I know you'll probably just say, well, we just get in there and every day- answer questions and help and build that network, but maybe it's, there's some tactics for people. It's not like rocket science, right? Yeah. It's go up consistently, lead with empathy. Don't yeah. be an asshole or whatever <laughs> you have to do with that. I like uh, that. No, that's good. Don't, like treat people like people should be treated, right? We're all made in the image of God, like follow the golden rule. 
right? Yeah. Treat people the way you want to be treated. Um, and I, when you mess up, apologize, own it, right? Like we're, no one's perfect. Not, like we all make mistakes, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, don't try to sell people. Just build relationships. Be cons be there consistently. It took us probably three months to from when I started to get our first community led deal. Um, it took us another four months to go our first deal in another community. It's funny, Pavilion's actually the one that took us the longest. Uh, it took mm -hmm. us like eight months, I think, to get our first like community led deal in, if out of Pavilion. Um, or that we would attribute that way. Mm -hmm. But then it started snowballing, right? All of these things that took three, four, five, six, eight months. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, you, like we were talking about before, that momentum built up. And now we've got this thing that just rolls, right? Um, which is really cool, but it takes time. Yeah. It takes effort. It takes consistency and it takes patience, right? just like anything else, nothing gets built overnight. Mm -hmm. You have to beta test, figure out what works. How do you um, streamline a process that's going to be effective and work for your your team and the skill set that they have while still being respectful of the community? And it's not like shooting fish in a barrel, right? It, it yeah, they these aren't your targets that you're going after. These are other people that you're building relationships with that you get to learn from. And ideally, along the way, you get to teach them something, too. I think that frame, if we could get more sellers just coming to the table with that frame, even marketers, like we would have a better revenue team as a whole. I think you're just healthier long term. Yeah, probably. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so we've, we've solved how to go to marketing communities a little bit. I, I think those were some great, great tactics to to start looking at and and put those rules kind of up on the on the board of if you engage this way it'll it'll happen over time if you're patient well tell me a little bit about revops as a service and how carabiner group looks at revops and and some of the things you're doing for your customers yeah so the concept of revops as a service is uh, most people cannot afford a full-time team right yep. revops is a especially over the last three years uh, a part of the ecosystem that has gone up significantly in, in cost, right? Compensation there has increased, I don't know, something in the neighborhood of like 30 to 50%, depending on the role. Wow. Um, yeah, it, it grew a ton. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's in super high demand. If you look at the top 25 jobs on LinkedIn, seven or eight of them are RevOps functions with um, the head of RevOps, VP of RevOps being the number one uh, most deep job on LinkedIn right now. Wow. Um, it, it grew like crazy. At the beginning of 2022, there were maybe like 7,500 people in RevOps titles globally. Mm -hmm. By the time we got around to Dreamforce last year, that number had gotten up to 35,000 with another 17,000 open roles. Like, it's bananas. And there's just not enough people who've done it long enough yeah. to either know what good looks like or to have seen enough variation to be able to handle the different pieces that are coming at them that they haven't worked with before. So, um, when, uh, at and least, oh, define, ahead. define RevOps real quick. Cause I always think like yeah. tools and technology, data, a little bit of sales enablement, but what are the, what are the big buckets in there that you look at? Go to market systems. Okay. Go to market processes. Yep. Insights and analytics, your, your data piece, right? Yep. And then enablement. Yeah. So I, okay. those, that's the way I think about it. But I don't think about it just within the context of sales, marketing, CS. Those pieces are very important and they're foundational to running a good business. Mm -hmm. But you need to understand how those pieces affect finance and the business. What does it actually mean for marketing, sales, and CS to be successful in terms of bookings, and in terms of billings, what's actually cash that's coming in the door and how are you running your business? Uh, I think for us too, like, we're bootstrapped, right? We don't have that VC pressure, which is mm -hmm. amazing. I know a lot of people are in a, in a very different position, especially a lot of our clients, but mm -hmm. having that finger on the pulse financially 
of what's going on in the business really helps drive the efficacy of the actions that you're taking across each individual business unit and how you interpret the data. That makes that makes a lot of sense because like I, I'll go throw a stat out there. I think it was seventy percent or something like is between fifty and seventy. So someone's going to quote me on this afterwards, but they were CROs were fifteen percent off of forecast. Yeah, I believe it. Which you believe, but I'm thinking, okay, from a RevOps function, that's I'm surprised be, not more. Not more. Yeah, true. But that would be, I mean, how do you make a plan? How do you, you know, represent either as a public or private company where you're going if you're give or take 15% off and, you know, could be more, could be less, but that's a big gap. How does RevOps play into that? And what are some of the things you look at to kind of help teams maybe get a little more accurate or be a little more consistent on those things? Yeah, it usually starts with taking a look at a baseline. How are the teams performing today? Mm -hmm. uh, coming in, doing an audit of the people, the processes, the technology, and the way that they're doing insights and analytics today, data governance. Uh, once we have a baseline, we can then you know, take a look at that, take a step back and say, okay, where, where are the bottlenecks existing within the business? Where are the places where we would expect to see a better throughput from an efficiency perspective? Or, mm -hmm. um, or where are we seeing um, really big numbers that don't necessarily make sense, right? Um, how does that relate to your TAM? How does that relate to your selling motion? How does that relate to your overall ACV? Mm -hmm. And then we start sort of picking those apart and going in and asking questions. Well, why has it been done this way? Can you tell me why your customers like it? Or why does your customer purchase in such and such a manner? And now we start looking at, okay, what's the customer's actual buying journey? How well has the existing go-to-market process been mapped to it? And then how can we leverage technology to help meet that need, mm -hmm. whether from a process automation perspective or from sending really good SOPs, whatever that might look like. Uh, the, the two areas that I would say we see the most issue, and this is across the board, it doesn't matter if you are a Series A company or if you're publicly owned um, or if you are PE owned. Right. Mm -hmm. It's usually bad data governance. Yep. A lack of set sales stage entry and exit criteria. Right. They don't understand a, a clear delineation between what stage one, two, three, four, and five mean, which means as they're trying to figure out what that conversion rate progression looks like, they don't have a really great way of framing it because it hasn't been well maintained. So mm -hmm. that's that's one piece of it. Um on the other side, what we see is folks who have just over-engineered the living hell out of their <laughs> systems uh, because they were trying to be something bigger than they are and they didn't keep it simple and really tie it to that customer's buying journey. If you can clean up those two things, it gives you a fighting chance of stripping away the fat, trying to run as efficiently and lean as possible so that you can then start figuring out what the actual problems are. Is it because we aren't giving enough enablement? Is it because we don't really understand what our ICP is that we're going after and we're re going after too many things? Is it because we have three different go-to-market motions? We have a PLG, an SMB mid-market motion, and an enterprise motion, but we're conflating it by treating them all the exact same way, mm -hmm. not recognizing the fact that our buyers in each of those segments buy very differently with very different ACVs and um, a very different time frame for which they want to make that transaction happen. So mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of different pieces to look at. Those are some good insights though and some good places to start. And we were talking beforehand, it was B2B buyers. And I've heard this a lot of times. I agree with you. B2B buyers are now buying more like consumers, B2C buyers. Yep. How has that buying journey changed over the last few years? And what are some of the things you're seeing that companies are having to do to adapt? There's some really fun things that I'm seeing. Um, I'm seeing a lot more companies switch to an Amazon-esque checkout screen. Cool. Right? Um, with T's and C's as a little link at the bottom, mm -hmm. right? Instead of having somebody sign a huge contract, here are all the, the things that are in your shopping cart that you're picking up and having people sign off that way. Um, Sweet. I, yeah, I think it's really cool. Uh, HubSpot actually does a tremendous job of it, right? Um, they don't send you some big docu sign that you have to go through and that um, you see legal is going to run through. 
they send you a link back and forth and back and forth. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, but if you go with that approach, red lines decrease dramatically because people typically aren't clicking through and reading. Yeah. Uh, Which I, I'm going to blame Apple for. Um, I was just going to say that. I think our (laughs) iPhones are to blame on that one because we all accept because we're like, okay, give me the next update. Yeah, but that sort of goes back to what we were talking about before, that instant gratification. Yeah. I just want what I want. I don't even know. I'm not going to read this thing. Yeah. Um, your GC will hate you for that. But <laughs> I think that's really innovative and, and a, a fun way to be able to de- take out that time, right? Because we all know contracts can add one, two, three, four weeks on the mm-hmm. back end once people have already decided that they want to work with you as a particular vendor. Um, other things that, I see people doing that are fresh. Um, there's a new tech out there called Reach Suite, which I'm really interested in. Okay. Um, I know the founder, Colin, there. It's R E A C H S U I T E. Um, similar concept to like a Walnut or a demo stack or a reprise, except okay. it lives right on the HTML. So giving people the ability to actually play with, click through, t- like, you know, have that tactile touch and ownership uh-huh. of the technology that they're trying to purchase instead of just screenshots that have words on them. I think that's pretty cool too. Uh, I, I think that's I, the biggest change. Like that to me, from a marketing perspective, I love that because if you can bring these products to life, I think that's the one thing even I'll give a shout out to chat GPT that we've all been talking about so much, but when you could go on and I remember just writing in the first prompt and just seeing what it would do and actually seeing it run and seeing it write and seeing it produce something Mm -hmm. all of a sudden AI, I think for a lot of people or generative AI became real. But that's like the oldest B2C trick in the book. It is right. Yeah. You put it, you put the thing, whatever it is in the person's hand. And as soon as they're holding it, they can now physically envision themselves owning it having it using it yeah right? um i think i can't remember if it was the summer after my freshman year of college or the summer after i graduated from high school i sold cutco knives <laughs> <laughs> i love it okay i had a roommate right? that did that yep I, I i was very good at it for that summer uh, until i ran out of people for people to refer me to um mm-hmm. <laughs> but it, the it's like it, i remember being unlocked at like 18 or 19 years old where once you gave that person that knife and like they cut with it and they used it and like hey what are you making for dinner today great let's do that Mm -hmm. um they feel the ownership of it and it's the same thing today if you can give your clients a way to experience and feel the ownership of that future impact that you're promising them that your product is going to be able to deliver or that your service is going to be able to deliver you are so much more likely to win Mm -hmm. Uh, we've used that time and time again. Um, Seamus is a brilliant architect. Um, I'm okay, but he does a really good job. And we'll talk to our clients and have an awesome conversation. And that unlocks, for us at least, you know, the feeling of trust that we yeah. are here for partnership. Like It just reinforces all the p- positioning that we've brought to market. So it works in so many different aspects. You just have to find a way of making it real. Yeah. Well, and and I love your reference of Cutco because everybody has knives at home, right? So you're selling to somebody who has knives. And I think five years ago in the B2B space, you weren't selling to people that necessarily had knives, right? They're looking at new stuff. Oh, I've never really had this before. But in most of the spaces, people are either entering with new products that are similar, maybe a little different or an upgrade. Or most of these companies have purchased something like you before, either had success, and so they've got brand loyalty there, or they got burned. Or, or most of the time, they've got burned, right? They've yeah. had shelfware yeah, where they, they used half the licenses, and there's a CFO that's pissed off about it. I don't want to pay that company X anymore. Yep. All right. Well, what about company B? Because company B is going to give it to us for half the cost, and they promise not to over, blah, 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 right? And Yep. You know how that game goes. A hundred percent. And I think that's what's made it so much harder to sell in today's market. It's what goes back to our initial discussion. It's like the community, the trust piece, the the being a vetted person that's that's seen out there, trusted what you say and what you do is 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 it aligns, yeah. right? Then all of a sudden it snowballs. So what excites you about the future of RevOps, future of RevOps as a service and kind of where this industry is all going? 
As far as what excites me about RevOps, um, it's fun to see RevOps getting a seat at the table. Yeah. And I think through the continuing education of the entirety of the C-suite, people are waking up to the whole data-driven piece. Mm -hmm. uh, what doesn't excite me is that a lot of the times I still see, and I get it, you know, people are feel, fearful for their jobs and it's a huge undertaking. So you see a lot of folks pay lip service. Yes, I want to be data-driven, but I'm not actually going to do all the things that to drive it to completion. And now I'm driving around with a car that doesn't have a left door and a right bumper. <laughs> um, Good my mental steering, my, yeah, my yeah. steering wheel only turns left and right, but I, I can't really go straight too well. Yeah. So um, the, there's that aspect of it. Oh, man, there, I, there's just so much happening in the space. I'm curious what's going to happen over the next six months to a year, because over the last six months to a year, there's been all of these companies that have come out starting to create technology for the RevOps space, recognizing that it's growing so quickly. Uh huh. I'm curious to see how those pieces of technology kick off. The other piece I'm really interested to see is the continuing um, consolidation across, you know, the alphas. Yeah. Uh, you know, the players like Gong and Zoom Info. I don't know if their technology is the best anymore. Yeah. And Zoom Info, it's definitely not. And I feel like with Gong, there's other things that are starting to either catch up or pass it, mm -hmm. where all right, a gong license costs me, well, I don't know, $600 a year. Maybe I can cobble together two other pieces of tech that are $250, $300 a year, and those two pieces of tech do exactly what I use my two main use cases for gong. So I think that's an area for concern for some of the bigger companies and an area of excitement. Right? There's all these little niche players that are starting to pop up. How can you find the right mix for your business in the stage of where you're at. Um, mm -hmm. that, I think, I think that's a fun, that's a fun conversation because I agree. Like I'm seeing HubSpot and you're looking and watching them grow and they're by no means a small one, but compared to Salesforce, they've always been kind of the underdog. Everyone's small compared to Salesforce, man. Of they're, course. They're just freaking huge. But, but you look at that and you go for a lot of businesses, a lot of organizations, you may not need everything that, that Salesforce throws at you. And HubSpot might be an easier you way. You definitely don't need everything that Salesforce throws at you, man. <laughs> One of the worst experiences I ever had was on a call with 15 people, eight of them from Salesforce, right? Only three from the customer. And they tried pitching them. I kid you not, 15 different products in a three-hour demo. <laughs> and you're sitting there going, okay, <laughs> just one of those products, like just CPQ or just one of these things is going to take No, they you... already had CP they already had CPQ as shelfware for the last year, as well as part oh. or two years. Like <laughs> <laughs> it it goes terrible. back to that insight of like where things are going to shift and change. I think that's fascinating uh, to see that from a RevOps perspective, a lot of those alphas are getting lapped in the innovations. I mean, I think of just these new AI driven companies and, and companies that truly have been born with AI as a core foundation. I'm seeing a lot of very, uh, I guess you could say, uh, you know, responses from the older stalwart companies like, well, we've been doing this forever, blah, blah, blah. But no, there's going to be a lot of innovation curve in the next few years. It'd be exciting to see. Doing things the way that they've always been done and for the sake of tradition is one of the worst reasons to keep doing something. And I think every company needs to take a really stark look every quarter, every yeah. half year. Is this still the right thing for us? You have to really be introspective. And the things that got us to 5 million aren't going to be necessarily the things to get us to 10 or to 20 or to 50, right? Mm -hmm. um, you have to change pace, especially with what's going on in the economy. I think that's, that's spot on and it's changing faster than ever. So I like that idea of like quarterly every half year, because I think a lot of people, they get into, oh, this is the leading technology. I'll go sign up for a two or three year deal and it's no longer that leading technology in a year and a half from now. Or yeah, which is going to beg some questions, right? Everyone's going to keep selling annual contracts, but what if I think I'm a you know brand new company? Mm -hmm. I don't want to buy annually anymore. I want to buy monthly or I want to buy quarterly. And I want to be able to, if the change management isn't too onerous, go from what fits my go-to-market motion at that point in time. 
I don't know. I'm curious to see how all of that could play out. There's so many ifs and thens and what ifs uh, in the coming months and years. But it puts, again, that onus right back on RevOps because I think those are the people that have to be, to me, it's a competitive advantage. If you have a really strong RevOps function or support team, you can make those changes a lot faster and be a lot more agile in that space. Whereas I've seen companies be very challenged to get through that change change management or they just go, eh, it's not even worth it. We're just staying with the old stuff. I mean, that's definitely part of it. Uh, sometimes RevOps can be a change, a change agent for good. And sometimes they are like, well, we like the way it is and we don't want to own another process. <laughs> yeah. So you have to have a good RevOps team, again, whether that's internal or an outsourced firm like us or some of our competitors, or uh, you go know, rather not or you need that. And you need to have a, a C-suite or an ELT that's really dialed in and in agreement violent agreement on how they want to drive the business forward and then have them drive process, have them drive go to market again, based off of that customer's buying journey, because everything has to be going in alignment too often. I think all of these different business units end up being like kayaks that are going up and down the river, however, which way they want. And yeah. what you really need is a, a crew team, right? You need a coxswain calling it out You're, and everyone needs to be in lockstep rowing together to constantly make sure that you're driving that forward momentum and you're not losing friction. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a good analogy. I like that vision of like that crew team because you think of other sports and it can be a little more chaotic. That is truly, you got to have a very clear vision and one person kind of calling the, the movement yep. forward. Yeah. So enough about learning from you. Cause I think we just got a, a short class on rev ops and the importance there, but also so many cool trends that I think are going to be changing soon. Take me back yourself just after graduating college, you know, what advice would you give yourself? Would you've ever thought you'd be where you're at today? Um, no, leaving college, I thought I was going to go be a lawyer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, financial collapse happened. So yeah. not great timing. Um, if I could give myself some advice, uh, it would have been to keep reading books. Yeah. Um, I laid off of that for a long time and I used to be like a monstrous reader. Um, I'm still trying to fight my way back into it. I, people keep sending me stuff and I keep buying stuff and I, 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 I make my way through, but not, not as quickly as I used to. Uh -huh. um, I blame, I blame the kids. Um, <laughs> Having, having three under three and a half will do that to you. But yeah, um, yeah I, I would say keep reading um, and stick with it. I, I don't know. Maybe that's just uh, the the perseverance in me. Right? I, I've been so many different industries. And while that could have been really frustrating and was at times, um, all of that accumulation of different industry knowledge and having seen so many different things from Fortune 20 all the way to like, a three person startup has served me and us well as a company and our clients well. So in high, like, yeah, I, I would, there's some things I would have, I'd advise as far as like maybe business routes to go down, but um, I'm, I'm happy with how it all ended up. I, I, the more people I talk to, the one thing I find with a lot of them is they have these very kind of, they've, they've gone wide. They've had a lot of experiences. And I think that makes, Maybe a little bit, not saying, hey, you can be very focused on one thing and be tremendous. But I tend to see that in the business acumen, being a little wider, you have this ability to now look at a lot of different companies. And it's like you said, I'm not just going into a company with my playbook, but I'm listening, I'm curious, and then I'm flexible enough to try and fit something for them. And I think that's that's critical in the way business works today. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. I think there's a strength there. So what do you do outside of work? What are some things you love? I know you're in New York area, kind of in the, on the East coast. So what are some things you're, you love to do? Um, I'm getting into woodworking, which oh, I'm cool. excited about. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I do like to build. Um, that's always fun. Um, I also play soccer and hockey pretty competitively. So I, I enjoy that. Uh, had a nice hockey game last night. I've got one on tomorrow. Wow. Tomorrow's Wednesday already. Um, so that keeps me busy. Um, and then I'm married, I've got three small children. So, uh, yard work and, you know, all the things just keeping a house running, um, 
and trying to support my wife as best as possible. And that definitely keeps me pretty busy. Um, That's but, awesome. you know, in, in, in addition to building Carabiner over the last two and a half years, I've also moved twice. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow okay so yeah three and, under three moving and building a company and still playing hockey yeah I'm impressed. yeah we're crazy and my wife's the same so you know there's there's, there's a good give and take that's but awesome it, well yeah. cliff where can everybody connect with you where can they find you obviously pavilion's a big shout out rev genius but what's yeah pavilion place? rev genius rev ops co-op whiz ops are the communities i tend to spend my the most of my time in um you can find me pretty easily on linkedin it's the Cliff Simon with a little cloud in front of it. Um, <laughs> by the way, great hack that I learned from Jocko when I took that revenue growth architecture course, because people with their copy and pasting your name, uh -huh. they, there's, there's an obvious really weird space or the cloud ends up getting pulled in. So I know if it's automated or someone actually wrote me something um, when they're hitting me up on LinkedIn or in the email or whatever. So that's always that's it, that's why it's there. It's super handy. But yeah, hit me up on LinkedIn. Happy to have a conversation. Um, if we can help you, great. If we can just point you in the right direction and you want to pick my brain, that's that's all fine by me too. Awesome. Well, hey, Cliff, thank you so much for uh, for joining us on the show and learned a lot from you today. Really excited to have you. Oh, thanks, Tim. Appreciate the time. Awesome. Well, another episode of B2B EQ. For all of you listening, um, please go and check out the show notes. Connect with uh, Cliff on Carabiner Group, on LinkedIn, Pavilion, all of those communities. And uh, click like, click share. Send this to somebody in RevOps that needs support or someone who doesn't get it so they can listen and understand and maybe make that RevOps journey a little bit better. Have a good one. We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast for more exciting insights. To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com.